I've been thinking about how to uh, start this message today, and I've decided to give you a couple of confessions of things that I have done that were totally my decision, uh, totally my responsibility. No one else was involved in these. These are all on me. And the first one I'm going to tell you about, I debated whether or not I should say this publicly, um, but I've decided to go ahead and make this confession. So it started when I took my family, my entire family, to see a movie. And uh, we went to this movie. It's an action movie. And we got there early. And I don't know what you guys do, what your tradition is, but we like to get there early and get the popcorn, you know, get the big gulp drinks. We go in there. And during the previews, we drink all the drinks and, drink and eat all the popcorn. And then, and then Dad goes out and fills it all up again and brings it back in for the rest of the movie, right? <clears throat> and so we do that about an hour in. I have, I have emptied out my, you know, big gulp for the second time. And I have, it started to dawn on me that I, I am not going to be able to make it all the way through this movie. <laughs> because I've had about 60 ounces of Diet Coke already. And this is not going to go well. And so we're in this action movie. I don't remember what movie it was because what happened afterward totally blew all that out of my mind. Uh, but we're sitting there, and I'm trying to think. I need to find a spot in the movie where it kind of is lull there and nothing really is going to happen because I think I can make it out and back in in about two and a half minutes and not miss anything. And so I found that spot in the movie, never seen the movie before. I thought, okay, this is a good time to go. So I got up, and I you know, bolted out the theater, and I was going down the hallway, saw the bathroom. I went right into the bathroom. I turned in, you know, to, the, to my right when I walked in the bathroom, and I saw on my left a whole bank of stalls there and so I was looking at the stalls and then I looked to my right looking for the drive through window you know what I'm saying <laughs> a lot of drive through windows and I didn't see any drive through windows other that was that's odd and so I went into the stall because I'm like I gotta go <laughs> so I get in the stall and then I about the time I got the you know the latch secured on the stall I hear a group of people coming in, and uh, they didn't have low voices. They had high-pitched voices. <laughs> and I thought, uh-oh, the women are coming into our bathroom. This is not a good thing. And then it dawned on me, mm, that's not what was going on here. I was in the wrong spot. And when I, when I recognized that, I had just gotten in the soul. When I recognized that, the first thing I did was I just, I sat down, boom. And I thought, should I keep my knees up or down or what should I do? Because it's obvious I don't have high heels on, you know. And then I sat there and I, you know, and I, I was trying not to listen. I was like, I don't, I don't want to hear any of, none of this going on. And, and then I thought, and then I learned something about you ladies. You take forever in the bathroom. I'm thinking, you know, in and out, but no, no in and out for you all. So I'm sitting there and I start to realize, you know what? I think I'm going to have to spend the rest of the night in the theater, in the bathroom until the thing closes and everybody goes out because I am not coming out of this stall. And so I listened and listened and listened and then, it, you know, there was no sound. And I thought, is it, I don't know if it's safe or not. And I didn't, I certainly didn't want to head out of the bathroom because I'm the pastor in a community, you know, and I can all, I'm thinking people know me. And there's like, I can see the headline, pastors found in the women's bathrooms, you know, and that's not a good thing to go, you know, hit the local newspapers. So I found a dead spot and, you know, no sound. And I thought it's safe to get out. And so I opened the stall door and I, I mean, I bolted and I went straight across in the men's room. I walked in the, in the men's room and I looked on my right, looked on my left. And there I saw the drive through windows and I'm like, I am home. You know, this is it. I go back to the theater and my wife looks over at me. She says, she says, what took you so long? I'm like, Detour. <laughs> you know, like, well, it, terrible. All right, that's one. And then the other one. I remember the first time I went the wrong way on a one-way street. Not the last time, but the first time. <laughs> Anybody ever done this? Yeah, right. There we all are. <laughs> Driver's education coming to all of us. I was in, this is before GPS. I'm in a city, I don't know where I'm going, I'm not familiar with the downtown area, but I take a, you know, I turn right on this one road, and I get on this road, 
And my first thought was, I can't believe all the idiots who are parking on the right side going in that direction. Like, what are they doing over here for? That's going to be hard for them to get in their car and turn around and go back out. But I thought, you know, I'm in a new city. I'm like, well, they don't know anything. And then I'm looking down the road, and then it happened. I saw some other idiot. There were two cars coming at me, and one guy was trying to pass the other guy in a downtown road. And I'm thinking, why in the world are you trying to pass somebody in a downtown road? And then it really hit me that he wasn't trying to pass anybody, but I was going the wrong way on the wrong road, and this was not going to end well. And so I did what anybody would have done. I ducked into one of those other, you know, parking spots, and then I, with all the confidence I could muster, I had this composure on myself of all this traffic came. I think I even opened my door because I wanted everybody to know, you know what? I meant to drive down this road like this and I meant to get that parking spot. <laughs> but on both occasions, when I started down that path, I thought I was doing the right thing, that I was in the right spot. And it took me a while to realize, you know what? I am totally not in the right spot. You ever been there? Well, in this series, we're talking about finding our way back to God. And the truth is that all of us at some point or another have drifted from God, haven't we? Some of us have drifted real far from God. Some of us have really never followed God, but we're just kind of trying to check all, you know, check all this stuff out. But all of us at some point have been far from God at some point. You ever seen this word? Rumspringa. It's a real word. It's a real word. It comes from the Amish community, not all Amish communities, but some Amish communities have this rumspringa experience where when a, when a kid gets about 16, 17 years old, they go on this season where it's kind of a hall pass, you know, and they can do whatever they want. They go into the city, they go into town, they do what is available to them to do, and it's this hall pass, and they're really in this season, they're sowing their wild oats, and when that season, however long it lasts, when that season ends, they have to make a decision. They have to make one of two decisions. Either they're going to come back and they say, you know what, I want, to, I want to commit myself to being a part of this community and a part of this church. And so they're baptized into their local uh, church, into their local community. Or they can say, I don't want to do that. I want to live out there. There's a lot of fun out there, and I want to live out there. And there's this sense of it's okay either way you go. It's kind of like a free pass on this whole deal, but it's called the rumspringa. Well, that's not just unique to Amish or Mennonite communities, is it? How many have ever been on a rumspringa yourself? Yeah, it's called college. <laughs> or nowadays, middle school. Um, But sometimes they last for six months, sometimes nine months, sometimes it lasts for 10 years. Where we're just sowing our wild oats. We're going after life. We're just saying, you know what? I, I, I want to go after what's available to me. I want to live it up. I want to go for the gusto. I want to have all the experiences that I can possibly have. I don't want anybody to tell me what I can do or can't do or shouldn't do or what. I just want to go, 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 go. We probably all experienced that. Last week, we heard from Jake. He started to tell his story a little bit. If you were here last week, you probably remember. But I want to go back. I want to hear some more from Jake and his story. Why don't you turn to the screen and watch this? Uh, I grew up in a, a Christian home um, with two parents who also grew up in, in Christian families. When I was young, about seven, my, my parents moved to a camp in central Illinois, a Christian youth camp. And that was a really, really cool way to grow up, uh, just surrounded by youth groups and, and Christian kids. And coupled with that, I also grew up in the church, surrounded by a family that uh, didn't just believe it, but they lived it. You know, I had a faith. I saw how it had played out in my family's lives, but I did not have a direction. And I did not have a purpose that I felt like I was being pulled towards or, or called to, just kind of searching, longing for a fulfillment that it seemed like everybody else in my family had. After, you know, searching from school to church, um, you know, the slopes of Colorado, I think I finally came down to, well, I want to pursue music in some sort. And I had a cousin in Nashville, and I finally just said, all right, let's go, let's try it. And then I moved down to Nashville, just hoping to 
find music or write or play or yeah, I wasn't really sure. Um, and just started bartending and waiting tables. Alongside that was was just a, a life of partying, uh, pleasure. I mean, just fun. Uh, it was great, I'm not gonna lie, it was a blast. I had a lot of fun, but it's also very unhealthy. It just became continual, just meeting girls and and drinking by five years in. I had moments where I laughed at myself and knew fools do this, you are living like a fool. Probably a year and a half after that, six and a half years in, uh, by that point, it was serious. It was drinking every day as soon as I get up uh, because I would have a horrible hangover. And I was starting to think, this is gonna be rough making it change at this point. Last week, we started to look at the most powerful story, the most famous story that Jesus ever told. It was a story about a son, a prodigal son, uh, who was the second eldest of his father, and he was on the outs with his father, and he basically said, Dad, I, I don't want to wait until you die to get my inheritance. I would like to get my inheritance right now. I feel confined, and, and so if you'll just speed up the process, I'll get out of your hair, because I, I don't think that what I'm looking for is here. I think it's out there somewhere. And so, shockingly enough in Jesus' story, which would never have happened in first century, this would never have happened, but Jesus told the story of how the father agreed to give the son his full inheritance. And then it says in verse 13 of Luke chapter 15, not long after that, in other words, not long after the son received his inheritance from the father, the younger son got together all that he had, all of his possessions, all of his wealth, and set off for a distant country. That's where we go, isn't it? To a distant country. And there squandered his wealth in wild living. And last week we looked at this and we talked about the fact that he was looking for something that he didn't quite find. Or he was thought, you know what, if I go out there, if I find it out there, it'll be something. And this is one of the first, there are five awakenings that we're going to see from this passage. But last week we talked about the awakening to longing, the awakening to longing, where we're saying to ourselves, there has to be something more to this. And we talked about the universal needs that all of us have, the need for purpose in life, the need to love and to be loved in return, the need for meaning and these are our deep longings, and we go after these longings, and the bottom line where we landed the plane last week was simply this. Life's deepest longings are given to us by God. Like, he puts these longings for love and purpose and meaning inside of us. They're given to us by God to lead us to him, to lead us to him. And so when we search for that meaning, when we have those longings and we're trying to fulfill those longings apart from God, we're going to bump into some brick walls and ultimately it's going to hopefully lead us back. But the first awakening that we talked about last week was the awakening to longing, the awakening to longing. And so we find this young man bumping into this awakening, that he's, he's, long, he's looking for something. And then it says in verse 14, going back to Luke 15, in verse 14 it says this, after he had spent everything, so he goes out into a distant land, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need, he'd spent it all. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who set him, sent him to, feed, to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. At this point, he's probably thinking, you know what, this is not exactly what I thought was going to happen. Like, this is not what I envisioned for my life. And all of a sudden, he bumps in to the second longing, to the second longing we're going to talk about, but he finds himself by alone. He, he's, he's alone. He has no purpose in life. Nothing in his life is making sense. And he's facing starving to death. And this is when he bumps in to this second awakening. Verse 15, it says this. Very important how this verse starts out. When he came to his senses. Say that with me. When he came to his senses. We've all been in that moment, haven't we? When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? 
And yet here I am starving to death. We don't know how long it was when he was feeding pigs to the point where it came to his senses, but there was probably some time there. He had a lot of time to perhaps to figure out, to think through this, like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is terrible. Like, I made a terrible mistake. You ever been in a position where you wish you could go back and undo something? You could not make that decision, not sign that contract, not get into that relationship where you could just say, you know what, if I could back up the truck a little bit and have a do-over, that's what I'd like to do. And this is what he's thinking. Ah, man, what was I thinking? If I could go back, I'd have it a whole lot better. And the awakening that he's bumping into is that of regret. He's sitting here thinking, you know what, this is a terrible mistake I've made. I wish I could start over. Every single one of us has been in a situation in life where we wish we could start over. Where we say, this is not where I wanted to be. I wish I could start over. I wish I could do this over. In fact, there are people in our lives who are watching us go down this road and they're thinking, you know what? You need to start over. You need to come back. You need to do this over again. But we have to have the awakening. We have to feel the regret. I remember uh, when my wife and I had been married for about eight years. There was a stretch and a season in our marriage, and, and I have permission to talk to you about this today. There was a season and stretch of our marriage where it was not good, really at all. And for about a year and a half, two years, it was just, it just got progressively worse. Not immediately, it wasn't all in one fell swoop, but progressively worse and worse and worse. And to the point where there really wasn't any affection, there really wasn't any warmth in our relationship. It was just kind of stone cold. And I remember there was a, a point, and I didn't realize really how bad it was. I was beginning uh, to, to, to become aware of this. You really don't know how bad it is, gentlemen, until she tells you how bad it really is, right? That's kind of, we're kind of oblivious to those kinds of things sometimes. And I remember laying in bed one night, and the best way I could describe it to you is you, when, when someone shows you a picture, they hand you a picture, you can see the entire picture at one shot, right? You kind of see the whole thing. And when I was laying in bed that night, it wasn't a vision, but it was like I just got this picture of the state of my marriage, of the state of the relationship that I have with my wife, and it was awful. And it really honestly was dead. And in that moment, I realized, you know what, this is my doing. You know, 99% of what we're, where we are is because of me. And my wife was at a point where she just thought, you know what, I'll take our son and I'll have a separate checking account and James, you can go do your thing and I'll, you know, me and my son, we'll do another thing. We'll live in the same house, but we're just roommates, really. That's kind of where we were. It was a scary time. And I knew that just saying I'm sorry wasn't going to be enough because I'd said I'm sorry a lot. And there's a point at which sorry isn't enough, isn't it? Where it's like, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I want to see something different. And I had a realization in that night that it was going to take a long time to get out of the situation that we were in. But I was committed to that. I had that picture. And it's... This moment, I think, when we hear this sentence where it says, where Jesus says in the story, when he came to his senses, when he got the snapshot of what was really going on in his life, there was regret. He realized something had to change. Turn your attention back to the screen. Let's hear more from Jake and his story. I was pretty functional. Uh, considering, went to work and maintained this I party every night kind of attitude and I partied openly every night so that when people would smell down me the next day it was normal because well I parties every night I was at my sister and brother in law's house uh, checking on their house they were in South America uh, for his work and I was drinking and I just had this totally normal moment of going this has to stop like I, I, I have to stop I, I will die at some point from this if I don't 
And I couldn't stop that night because I had to work the next three days and I knew it's gonna be ugly and I won't, I won't be able to work. I knew after Wednesday night at work, I would have four days off in a row. So I prayed to God that night. I said, God, I need to stop drinking on Wednesday. <laughs> so please keep me safe for the next three days. So that night, Wednesday night, I went back to my sister and brother-in-law's and took my last drink and went to bed. And I would say I woke up four or five in the morning with immediate DTs. This was not a, a day later, this was hours. And I mean, yeah, I couldn't see straight, kind of hyperventilating. I'd had one before, so I knew exactly what it was. I'd had the doctor explain it to me. So that started Thursday morning, really early before the sun came up, and that just went all day, all night. Friday, all day, all night. And I should have, you know, been with a doctor, or nurse, been at a rehab center, something just to make sure I was okay. But uh, as I was laying there, I just kept remembering this prayer from a book about a Celtic monk that I loved growing up. My dad introduced me to the author. The prayer that he goes to anytime he doesn't know what to do is, Lord have mercy. And it's just, he repeats it. It just becomes this meditation. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And that's what I did from, from Thursday morning till Saturday, knowing the whole time and kind of laughing at myself that like, I really don't deserve this, this mercy, this grace, but asking anyway and receiving it. Saturday morning, I think the last DT was around 11 o'clock and I got up and I started drinking water and started keeping water down. And Saturday night, I finally slept, just fell asleep, crashed out and got up the next day and went to church. That was pretty much my first response. Talked to the campus pastor that Sunday morning and said, this is where I'm at, uh, what, what can I do? Who can I talk to? How can I get connected? What I love about what Jake just said there was that prayer that became his meditation. You know, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Maybe you're in a season right now where that needs to be your prayer. Like, God, I, I, just, I just need your mercy. I just need your mercy. Because here's the thing. We can't find our way back to God until we come to our senses and wake up. We can't find our way back to God until we come to our senses and wake up. This is an awakening that has to happen in you. It has to happen in me where we just realize, you know what? This, is, this has got to stop. And maybe you're at a place like that today. Richard Rohr one time wrote this. He says this, you cannot heal what you do not acknowledge and what you do not consciously acknowledge will remain in control of you from within festering and destroying you and those around you. And maybe you're in a moment right now where you're, you're just saying, you know what? That's me. Like, I, 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 am in a, I am out of control. My life is headed in a direction that's going to wind up in disaster. And the reason you're here today is, is for this message. That other people in your life have probably seen this and they've been praying for you and they've been wondering, but there has to be an awakening in your own life. Maybe it's a relational thing that you're just straying away and it's like, you know what, you can't go down that road. Maybe it's a financial deal, maybe it's a substance abuse thing, maybe it's an addiction of some sort where you just say, this has to change. And this is your moment. This is your moment. You know, when the, when the prodigal son had this awakening of regret, thinking, what have I done? I, I, have, I, have, I have made a terrible mistake. That was regret. And you know what? Regret is just the beginning. It's not the end. A lot of times we think, oh, I feel bad about what I've done. I have a regret. But it's not the end. That's not the goal. It's just the beginning. There's something more. And this is what our bottom line is for today. This is, this is what I want you to understand. Regrets are a wake-up call from God to get you moving in a new direction towards him. Regrets are a wake-up call from God to get you moving in a new direction toward him. 
What happens a lot of times is people experience regret. They have these longings that they try to chase after, and they're not chasing after those longings from God. They're trying to chase after those longings in some other way, to fill those longings in some other way other than God, and they wind up with regrets, and they think, well, that didn't work. I'll just try this. Well, that didn't work. I'll just try this. And they go through this this, this cycle of longing and then regrets and longing and then regrets and longings and then regrets. And what you have to understand is the regrets that you have, they are from God to get you moving in a new direction towards him. I love what it says in verse 15. This is how it says, and this is, there's two steps to this. Number one is I I just got to understand, hey, there's something wrong here. There's a regret and it's leading me towards God, but it's just the beginning. There's something else. It says there again in verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, I will set out and go back. Say that with me. I will set out and go back. I'm going to have to do this to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. It's not just that I've made a mistake. It's the fact that, Dad, I have dishonored you. I have sinned against you. And, oh, by the way, I've also sinned against God. This wasn't just an oopsie-daisy. This is like a sin. And I've got to go back. In other words, when he says, I've got to go back, I will. This is a decision right here. This is a firm decision that moves us in a direction. I will go back. You see, we don't accidentally drift toward God, do we? We don't gradually drift toward God, do we? Sometimes I think that's how we think, that we just, you know, just accidentally I'll stumble into you know, going back to God in some way or I'll drift back to... The whole trajectory of life in this world takes us away from God. This is not something that happens by accident. It's not something that you just stumble into. This is something that you have to make a decision. You've got to make a decision. I'm going back. Here's another word that may be new to you. It's the word... Metanoia, metanoia. It really comes from two words. The first part of this word is meta, and that word meta means change, transformation. In fact, it's the root word for the word that we use for metamorphosis, like total change. That's what it means. Noia, at the end of this word, it means mind. It means your mind. So when you put these two words together, it means to have a transformation of the mind. Metanoia. It's a, it's a change in one's thinking, in other words, that results in a change of direction. It's a change in your thinking that results in a change of your direction. You ever heard that word before? Sure you have. Because it's a Greek word that's translated in the New Testament, repent. That's what that word means. It doesn't mean to feel sorry for something. Uh, It means that you're going to have to change the way you, there's going to have to be a transformation of your mind, the way that you look at the world around you, the way that you look at how God looks at things. There's got to be a change of mind, and that change of mind moves you in a different direction. You see, repentance is motion, not emotion. Emotion is regret. Repentance is is motion. It puts us in a new direction toward God. So where are you right now? Are you stuck in this cycle? Are you stuck in this cycle where you're just longing and regretting and longing and regretting and longing? you got to break the cycle. And the way that you break the cycle is our bottom line. Your regrets are a wake-up call from God to get you moving in a new direction towards God him. And maybe you say, you know, James, I, I've, like, I, I have gone so far and so long, and I, I don't even know my way back. And the thing that keeps a lot of people from finding their way back to God is not that they don't have this awakening of regret, it's that they're afraid. They're afraid to go back. They're afraid to go back to the people that they have, have you know, have 
strayed from. They're afraid to go back thinking they're not going to love me anymore. They don't want him, you know, they're a, a sack of trash like me. They don't want somebody like that. There's no way that God could want me. It's so far, it's so bad, there's no hope. But that's not true. And that's why Jesus told this story. He told the story of a son that went as far as he could possibly go. And that awakening of regret came. And it moved him in a new direction, back toward his father. And it can do the same for you, for your heavenly father. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been a Christian for a long time, but you've drifted away what do you do? You just need to come back. God, I, I, you know, I'm sorry. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against other people around me, and I, and I want to come back. If you have never been a follower of Jesus, you've never made that, like, I, I need to follow Jesus. You can, and, and when people do that, you know what they do? Kind of, as a, kind of as a first step on that. They are baptized into Jesus. That's a way when they go public with what they're saying. They're saying, you know what? I'm putting a stake in the ground, and I can't change what I've done. I can't change where I've been. But, but as far as I can, you know, my best effort, my best, you know, direction of my life, I want to walk with Jesus. I want to run in his direction. I'm coming back to my heavenly Father who loves me and has open arms for me. That's what they do. They drive a stake in the ground. And by doing that, they're saying, you know what? I belong to him. It doesn't mean that they're perfect. It doesn't mean that they're never going to stumble because they do, and we will, and I do. Everybody does, but it means I belong to him. I'm coming home. Amen. Yeah. In two weeks, we're going to give you the opportunity to drive that stake in, your, in the ground and say yes to Jesus, to say yes to following him with all of your heart. And if you've never been baptized before, if you've never been immersed into Jesus Christ, two weeks from today, on Sunday morning, we're going to do that at the close of each of these services. This is something that you do not want to miss. If you've already been baptized, you don't need to go through that again. You just need to pray. But what I want you to do is be here for those who are coming home to their father. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Just everything about our church is for those who are far from their Heavenly Father. And we can be far from the Heavenly Father. People who go to church every week, we can be far from the Heavenly Father. But there are, there are people all around us who have those longings of purpose, of love, of meaning, and it is answered in Jesus and in Jesus alone. Nothing else in this life really ultimately will satisfy. It's just like eating a marshmallow. It just doesn't do it. It may be sweet for a while, but it make you fat. <laughs> and that ain't good. That wasn't in my notes. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> the guys in the back are saying, I don't see the marshmallow thing. Where's that? Everything in our church is about this. Helping, find, helping people find their way back to Jesus. Last week, we talked about uh, Blaise Pascal and the wager that he encouraged the intellectual friends of his day to make that, who didn't believe in God, who thought it was just kind of, you know, this story that was made up. And he said, fine, hey, that's fine. And so we invited you to start praying this prayer. This is your action step. We're going to add to this prayer this week. But the prayer that we started praying last week was, God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. Because some of you feel distant from God, and you're like, I don't even think he's real anymore. But this is the prayer that you need to pray. God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. And then this week, what I want you to add to this prayer is, awaken in me the possibility that with you, I could start over again. Awaken in me the possibility that with you, I could start over again. So why don't you pray this prayer right now out loud with me. All right, here we go. God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. Awaken in me the possibility that with you, I could start over again. You see, Rumspringa is over. Repentance 
is here. It's time to come home. It's time to come home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this magnificent story of rebellion and sin and going hard away from you and then this awakening of longing, this awakening of regret that leads us all back to you and the fact that as our Father, you stand with arms wide open, not to condemn, but to welcome, to embrace, to give purpose and meaning so that we can be loved with an undying love. God, I pray that every person listening to this message right now, that they sense the stirring of your spirit in their heart and that their days of running are over, their days of this endless cycle of longing and trying to fill all those longings with the wrong things and then having regrets and then longing and the regret that that cycle is broken and that they can find all of their longings, the true longings of their soul to be found and met and satisfied in you and in you alone. Father, I pray that as a church, as a body of Christ, we would repent, that we would turn and we would run in your direction, Father. And as we do, Father, as we do, Embrace us with your mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.